Hey everybody, welcome to, it is uh, Jason and Joel's Polar Exploration <laughs> Week here in the Midwest. Yeah. We're taking a brief break from board gaming to just talk about how to survive uh, when you have no pipes in your house left because they all burst, <laughs> uh, how to not go out in the snow for more than a minute without dying, um, and that all that and more on this week's Polar Survival with Jason and Joel. Uh, that's all lies. We're still board game mechanics because, I mean, like, we, you, yeah, we'd be the last people probably to talk about those kinds of things, right, Jason? Yeah. Plus, I don't, I, as a normal thing, I don't like to go outside anyway. So this just gives me an excuse. I didn't even make it to Weeblos, like in Boy Scouts. So, <laughs> Cub Scouts. Yeah. Nature's not my thing. <laughs> so. We'll pass. We'll pass on that. Uh, but yeah, be safe. I hope everyone's safe. I hope everyone's doing okay. Um, actually, by the time you guys hear this, it'll be like 50 in Indiana, like based on like the weather forecast, literally 50 degrees Monday. And Ohio. Negative, yep. as, as we're recording this, it's like negative 20 at my house. So they're talking about wind chill change of nearly 100 degrees in 72 hours. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. That's Ohio and Indiana for you. Yep, it sure is. Uh, so no wonder we love board games so much, right? <laughs> yep, that is true. Um, but you know what? Like we aren't meteorologists. We're board game. I don't know. I was gonna say board gameologists, but that's <laughs> super cliche to do that kind of thing. I yeah. don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Speaking of meteorologists, maybe we should just go to the news. Um, no, I'm not gonna let you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was an amazing segue. <laughs> Oh, it's no, so good. No, uh, it's squashed. Hey, listen, I got to tell you what, about a game I played, Jason, okay? Up top here. All right. I, uh, I ordered and installed a bidet last week. So, like, uh. it's a pretty awesome game. It's like a dexterity game, a party game, um, filler game. No, it's an anti-filler game. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't think it's filling. Yeah. <laughs> pretty awesome, though. That really is, cool game. That is awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay, you can go to news now. <laughs> All right, so it looks like Kickstarter news is actually starting to pick up, which is interesting. So again, the Dice Tower still rocking and rolling, uh, so we won't mention that here. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about is an expansion to Railroad Rivals, and it's coming to Kickstarter on February 26th, and it's called Robber Baron Expansion. So it will include a six-player color of green, some new commodity cubes that will be white, a new railroad stock, some new city tiles, some upgrade tiles, and some tiles that are going to let you mess with other people's stocks. So it'll give the game a little more interactivity because it didn't really have that before. So if you like Railroad Rivals, I say go check this out in February on the 26th. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm interested in this. Uh, Jason, you've got a review of Rail Railroad Rivals up on the YouTube channel. So if you don't know if you're into it or not, Jason's got to look at it there. Uh, worth checking out probably. Yep, it's a good game, and I think this will add probably what it was lacking. It, need, it needed a little more, this is going to sound strange for me, but a little more interactiveness, so that'll be cool. Yeah. All right, so the next thing I'm super pumped about, and Portal announced that they're bringing a bunch of their games back to Kickstarter this year, I guess, for their like, 20th anniversary. And the only game that I even saw that I remotely cared about was... Predaporter, third edition, coming to Kickstarter sometime this year, and it has new art from Quan Chai Moria. I'm not sure what games they've done, but they've done a ton. Like, that name is really familiar, and if I saw the games, they would ring a bell, but there are the cover of the box is beautiful, so I'm super interested. Can finally get my hands on this game and not have to pay a hundred bucks. So, Predaporter, Kickstarter this year, pumped. A hundred bucks is optimistic. hundred yeah, bucks for like. True. I line my dogs kennel with this game for a couple of years. Uh, it's covered in real bad dog stink, but $100. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think it's like 250 or something normally, which is crazy. Yeah, no, this is interesting. I, I don't think I'm going to back it. Just, I don't know. I don't feel like it's I'm that into it. I'll happily play your copy just to say I experienced it. But like, I, I don't know, man. Like, I looked at it and I'm like, this looks okay. It looks like a Jason game. Um, and I think you'll happily play it and you'll really enjoy it. But I feel like... 
it was a short run, you know? So I feel like that's part of it, that it's like this grail game for a ton of people. And that's and that's fine. Right. I've got my own grail games too, you know? But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I'll jump on this one or not. Yeah, my only hesitation with it is it's Portal and their rule books are some kind, sometimes convoluted and not that well written. So I'm kind of kind of worried about that. But who knows? It's the third edition, so maybe he'll work out the bugs. That's cool. There was a new expansion announced for role player. And it's called Friends and Family, and it's coming out in 2020. Not much more than that that's been mentioned, but I'm super excited about that, even though I haven't played the other expansion. But more role player is always a good thing. So 2020, be on the lookout. Is this the one that makes it into a dungeon crawl, or is that a different one? No, that's called like uh, Lockdown or something like that. That's a different game. Which is like almost like a standalone game, but you can play it with role player, it looked like. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Okay, so Jason, I do have one piece of news, and this is going to be pretty awesome i think for everybody hearing this so board game geek has been really a cool place to go and ever since i started going there years ago i always thought man why isn't there like a way to like have it give you game suggestions because you you see all these games and there's like man can can you please give me some suggestions on stuff that i might like you know um so based on the games i do like already so they've done that. And I don't know if you saw that or not, Jason, but if you go to Board Game Geek, they just released this feature in the last week or so. Um, if you click on a game and then you hit the more thing all the way on the right on the heading, it says fans also like. And it's a brand new thing they added. So I went to Predaporter just for you, Jason, because I want to see how this works out for you. I think you'll be a big Predaporter fan. Yep. Let's see how these match up for you, okay? Let's see how they did with their algorithm. I think they did pretty well. So okay. if you're looking for other game suggestions, look at maybe some of your favorites and see what else pops up. So uh, here we go. CO2, Jason. Boom. Nice. You own uh, that one. Own it. Yep. Shipyard. You've been interested in that, I know. Yeah, I'd like to play that. Yep. Magnum Saul. I don't even don't know. Don't know a thing about that one. Yeah, so, Jason, I'm going to open that in a new tab so that way it can be a new one of your grill games you want. <laughs> uh, Aura at Labora. Yeah. Vinos. I'm actually not interested in Aura at Labora, but Vinos is amazing. And it's a good one, too. Look at that. <laughs> Ground Floor. London, first edition. Dude, this is actually kind of nailing it. So, um, I don't know. It's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm surprised they haven't done that before because Amazon, man, they've been doing it forever. Yep. So that's kind of a cool feature. I'm going to play around with that a little bit. I think I'll really like it. Um, I think it'll be something that, you know, um, will help us out when we're looking for something that we might enjoy. Oh, yeah. that's uh, a- So that's cool. That's awesome. I'm super pumped about that. Dinosaur Island. You won't like Dinogetics. Oh, wow. That's interesting. It says that really? <laughs> no. Oh, I was going to say, wow, that's harsh. <laughs> okay. But, okay. Terraforming Mars, without giving you too many spoilers, is in my is in my top twenty for sure. Here are the games they think I'll like: Scythe, Great Western Trail, Gaia Project, Orleone, Caverna, Roll for the Galaxy, Clans of Caledonia. Yeah, those are all like my top twenty games that are like listed there. So I mean, yeah. like it's a pretty powerful engine. So uh, go check that out. The way how you get to it is by clicking any game. Then at the header where it says like overview ratings, blah 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 blah. All the way on the right hand side it says more. Then you hit fans also like. So that's kind of a really cool feature that they put in this. These uh these last you know like this last week or so so um anyway uh well hey I guess we should move on I don't know there's only so much heat left in my house so <laughs> <laughs> all right so I'm gonna talk about a game that I played and it is gonna be hitting Kickstarter here again shortly for an expansion that I also played because I did a video for it, and that game is The Little Flower Shop. This is a card drafting game from Dr. Finn's Games where you're trying to get the best-looking window in your flower shop with vases filled with certain types and numbers of flowers. You're also trying to collect these hanging baskets that you have to pay for by selling other flowers that are worth points at the end of the game. And you're going to do this through card drafting over three different rounds, so... The first round, you're going to pass to the left. Second round, you pass to the right. Third round, you pass to the left again. And then the Potpourri expansion, which I also played, adds like individual player abilities and kind of in-game goals that makes everybody different from everybody else. So that makes it a little bit more exciting and enjoyable to play with that. So if you like card drafting and you like cute flower themes or interesting themes, I say go check this one out. And that is The Little Flower Shop. Yeah, this game seems kind of interesting. You really did enjoy it then, huh? 
Oh yeah, I liked it a lot. It's it's up there as a, one of my favorite drafting games. I don't love drafting, so it takes like a special type of game for me to really sink my teeth into it. Uh, Jason, I don't know a lot about that game, but it looks really cool, and it's got that standard kind of Dr. Finn polished, good-looking game kind of thing going on for it. So, yep, uh, very cool. Uh, I'm going to talk about a game that Jason will never talk to you about, so... Jason doesn't have the guts to tell you about this game. Yeah, that's true. No, uh, it has nothing to do with, with uh, guts or anything like that. It's just a fun game that Jason, I think you'd actually like it. It's a game called Reckoners. And um, I got to play this. It's actually really fun. Um, it's it's Yahtzee, cooperative Yahtzee, basically. So oh, that's, um, that's cool. That's a fun game. Like basically, I don't know if you know much about it, but like there's these trays. It's all done by like the inserts are all done by game trays. So honestly, game trays should be the publisher of this game. Like if I'm going to be honest, because those trays and all the components that come in there are the star of the show. I mean, like these trays that you have and all the tracks and how everything slides. Game trays had to be like instrumental with the design of this game, but all that stuff basically um, allows for this game to be even possible. I would say. Um, I, I let me back up here. You basically have five locations on a board, and then there's this like cardboard inserts that slide into the different places, or like they're not cardboard inserts. The cardboard inserts do go there, but they're just the the static locations. But then there's like these villain cards that slide in, and they have like these powers that keep getting bigger and bigger unless you knock them down, and those powers trigger up the main bad guy uh, abilities. And so the way how this game works is basically there's these things called epics. They're superheroes. But they're all evil in this world. So we as like citizens have to like try and keep these superheroes from taking over the world. Um, so we're all working together to do things. One guy was a sniper. He had like a special ability that let him like fight things at multiple locations at one time. Um, the guy I played was able to like reduce powers and abilities of the bad guys. But you're basically using these die that you roll. You roll six die, doing the Yahtzee method of rolling three times and keeping at least one die to like kind of pool all these die together to fight against all these cards and bad things that can happen to you as a team. So really cool. Um, every player has slightly different die. They have three of the base die and then three of these other die that like have special symbols that are exclusive to you. So like you kind of have roles that you do on your own. It doesn't do anything revolutionary. Like that whole like rolling die to like counter effects on cards or counter things that happen to you. Like that's the pandemic, uh, the cure. I think is the name of it, was a dice game that's cooperative that you kind of use du- dice in a pool kind of to fight off this thing. Um, the things this one does differently is it adds a really cool theme to it where you're like fighting as superheroes and warriors, but it also adds um, the fact that we can use our die in any order we want and we just talk as a team about how we want to do it. You also get powered up over the course of the game, so you feel really powerful by the end of the game. Um, but the coolest thing on it, I think, I mean, it sounds stupid, but these these trays that you have as a player like have these slots for the die to fit in. And then as you spend the die, there's like little individual holders to keep track of it. And it just made the game experience more, more fun, honestly. So a fun, cool game that you're just playing cooperatively, trying to fight these bad guys using a pool of die. Yeah. I mean, it does look amazing. I I watched Tom's video on it and those pieces, like the trays that everything goes in are really slick. So if nothing else, it's amazing looking on the table. Yeah. This is one that like, I would pay sixty bucks for this game probably, but I'm not going to pay a hundred for it. So I'm going to keep an eye on sales. But like, it costs a hundred dollars. Yeah, the base game is a hundred bucks. Dang. Yeah, I mean, but it's really nice components and all the little sliders are metal. The die are really big chunk, chunky die. Uh, they call those Joel die, nice <laughs> chunky thick die. <laughs> So I uh, no, it's a cool game, really cool game. Uh, I really do like it, and I would suggest it to anybody who gets a chance to play it. And actually, when this one came out on the table, like we had just finished playing um, Transatlantic, which maybe I'll talk about one of these other days. But I was like, man, that was a good game. I want to play something that was really good and Euroy. And then this like basically a Meritrash game hits the table, and I was like, uh, <laughs> it ended up being a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. I would probably play it if it was around. I just I don't love co op, so that's my one hang up really on it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, if you don't like co-ops, it's not for you. (laughs) Right. All right, cool. All right, so the top 100 rages on like a winter storm in Ohio and Indiana. It's raging on. 
Yes, <laughs> and I was going to make a really cool raging on about my number 50, 50 game, but that would be super inappropriate. So um, you go ahead and do that, and we'll forget that I was going to make that joke. All right, I could do that. All right, so my number 50 is a two-player version of another very popular card game, and it is Seven Wonders Duel. Uh, Seven Wonders didn't make my list. I don't, like I said earlier, I don't particularly love drafting. There's one that's really high on my list that I'll talk about later, but as a general rule, not my thing. But Seven Wonders Duel, I really like. It has like that um, pyramid that you're taking cards off of to draft onto your side to get the Seven Wonders stuff. So you're trying to collect science and blue cards, which are points, and red cards, which are military. Trying to win by either defeating your other player in military or just having more points than them at the end of the game. So if you like Seven Wonders and you want to play a two-player version that, in my opinion, is better than the original, Seven Wonders Duel is for you. So my number 50, Seven Wonders Duel. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is better than the uh, original. I mean, I just think for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's a better game. I think that like Mahjong thing of like trying to not give them too much and dueling back and forth, but you're trying not to let other cards flip over if you can help it. So like you're balancing, do I take the best card for me and potentially let them flip a couple of cards over and get some nice choices? Or do I take something that's okay, but isn't going to let him reveal anything and force him to reveal cards for me? Like that's really cool. Um, the way how the drafting works, uh, like that is really cool. The way how you're you're building your empire i mean like it feels like a lot of the richness of the original seven wonders honestly um so i don't know i think it's actually a really good pick so nice work thanks Uh, i'm trying to think i don't think i i yeah i don't think this one made my list i mean like it's a good game i really like it and like just because something's not my top 100 doesn't mean i don't like it like i definitely like this game a lot but um just didn't quite eke out the top 100 right yeah that's that's cool and I play this a lot with students, so I mean, like, I I do enjoy it, but yeah. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, not making a uh, storm, making a making a joke about something raging on or <laughs> conquesting anything. Uh, my number fifty is uh, Secret Hitler. Oh um, yeah, yeah, good call on the no joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> This game is like, it's called Secret Hitler. And I know people get like kind of hurt by the name and the fact that we're putting this guy back in the zeitgeist and like something that we view as positive, I guess. Um, And I get that. I mean, like, I don't know. I I guess uh, like I might have a problem with like Secret Bin Laden. You know, I mean, that (laughs) might be a game that like made me upset. But I mean, I mean, just because that was something we lived through, but I don't know. I, like it's more about parliamentary procedures and trying to like say like elections work this way and like I don't know it's a congressional game almost or something I mean like so it, it works with really any kind of hidden identity kind of thing like they've done secret Voldemort they've done secret Palpatine um, and I think they probably would have done secret Palpatine like if they had the Star Wars license if I had to guess yeah I mean because that works probably. really well um, but Secret Hitler really cool game the components in it are so great too that doesn't hurt. Um, that you have these really cool like embossed boards and wooden things that stand up in front of you and just all that goodness. Uh, my favorite social deduction type hidden identities kind of game there is for sure. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I I really like this game. It didn't make my list mostly because it's a party game. At least I don't think it did. Yeah, but I have played this game a ton and every time I play it, it goes over well. So I concur. My favorite... My favorite thing that happens in this game is, I mean, I'm not really a Will Wheaton fan, but I do like it when he says, um, Hitler, put your thumb back in your Hitler hole. That's kind of funny to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The narration on the app is pretty awesome. Yeah. So number 50 <clears throat> secret Hitler. All right. So moving on from party games, we're moving on to our boy, Stefan Feld. And my number 49 is Trajan. And Trajan is a game that you are kind of moving around on this board in a Mancala type fashion. You're trying to get certain color chips in these certain bowls so you can get bonus actions. You're trying to send your guys out and to move around this map to collect tiles because it's like a set collection thing where you're trying to have military and fire and stuff. If it sounds like I don't know what the theme is, it's because I really don't know what the theme is. You're basically going around to these bowls. You're collecting pieces. You're trying to end the game with the most points. 
it's normal Stefan Feld, Stefan Feld fashion, but the way that this one's done is kind of interesting. Not my favorite Feld game, but I do really enjoy it. So, number 49, Trajan. People who like Trajan might also like Bora Bora, Zulkin, Twa, Keyflower, Glass Road, <laughs> and Bruges. I like all those games. I've never played Black, uh, Glass Road, though. Yeah, uh, it's a filler game. I mean, like, honestly, it's kind of a filler Not game, really. uh, which is crazy. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, just it's really short. It's really quick. It's brain burning. Um, all right. I should put my list back up because... That was that was very good distraction that I just put in the <laughs> middle of our show, but I need to get back to my list. Uh, um, I, I just love that feature, man. I mean, like it's just really cool that it just yeah it works. Yeah. Did you say you liked Keyflower? That's pretty cool that you said that. I do like Keyflower. Yeah, I mentioned that I thought before. Yeah. Um. No, I didn't know if it if it landed with you or not. I mean, you and I played it together. I think right. Yeah. It's not top one hundred, but I do like it. Yeah. I yeah I like it quite a bit too. Um. All right, my number forty nine, Jason. Uh, is one that, um, man, I don't know where this one's going to be at um, because I'm wrapping this game up and I'm not sure if it's going to have staying power beyond the legacy aspect. Um, and that game's Charter Zone. Um, so I've really enjoyed unpackaging all the little boxes, putting the stickers on the board. I've enjoyed the experience of playing it with my family, doing this basic worker placement game that gets more and more advanced as the time goes on. Um Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm going to give do that thing where if you don't want to hear spoilers, like hit skip 30 seconds ahead because I want to just mention one thing that made this game so awesome to me. Um, so you're playing this game and like it's like an empty white box and then they're like, hey, pull the fake bottom out of the box and see all these little islands in there. And you're like, what? That's awesome. So like that was a really cool experience in this game too. Um, just all the different little twists and stuff that happened in there. I think everyone knew the king was evil like by the end of the first game. But anyway, um, yeah. Cool game. Cornerstone. Cornerstone. Charter Stone. <laughs> Cornerstone's a different game. Uh, and I think we're inside of 30 seconds now. So that was my number 49, uh, Charter Stone. Uh, yeah, I don't love Charter Stone. I've played into about four games of it. I don't know. It just, I'd rather play Viticulture. That's where I'm struggling. Like the story is just eh, for me, but a lot of people do dig it. I just, I don't know. Maybe I just need to get farther into it and it'll be more interesting. I don't know. I like the little okay, opening up packages thing for That's sure. That's true. And I like the who knows what's going to happen right. next thing, you know? Yeah, getting the new meeples so, out is really cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm the, only thing that's really, the only thing that's really cool about it, too, is the game starts out at like a 2.1 weight and it ends at like a, not like a four or anything, but probably a three and a quarter. You know what I mean? Like it just keeps ramping up. And so it's like a good way to build your gaming group, too, into more complicated mechanisms and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's from Stonemeyer Games. This top 50 brought to you by Stillmeyer Games, as Jason just mentioned, Viticulture as well. <laughs> yep, and probably more. All right, uh, number 48 <laughs> is, for me, it is a What's Your Game game, and it is the one that uh, has not been super popular by lots of people, and it is Vasco da Gama. So this is a game about traveling around the Mediterranean, doing some things, Hiring some captains, hiring some ship workers. You're trying to, the, the main mechanism is like a worker placement, but the trick is you're trying to pick these little economic discs to f determine when your character will fire. And based on this, this tile that flips, it could cost you extra money and such and such. It's a worker placement game. It's moving around, fulfilling contracts. It's everything I like. So my number 48, Vasco da Gama. Oh, yeah, brother. Tom Vassell, Jason Smith is calling you to the roof where he's going to defend Vasco da Gama's honor. <laughs> I don't know if I even care that much. <laughs> no, this is the one that he threw off his roof because it was so bad to him. Like, that's like it's notorious for its terrible review from Tom. Um, but it's a, I mean, Tom, if Tom doesn't like a game, Jason's going to love it. It's kind of where it comes to. It, it, it does feel like that. It's not even intentional, but it does feel like that. Like you're the anti Tom, which is okay. We need more than one voice out there. Yeah, that's true. No, it's a it's a cool game. I used to have it in my collection too. Um, no longer. Uh, but at any rate, um, yeah, it's it's a what's your game game kind of heavy. Uh trading in the Mediterranean, kind of a theme that's been done a lot, but this one's a little different with those uh, like there's like a number thing in this one, if I remember right. Like kind of yeah. like a hidden number thing. Yeah, it's like one to twenty and then like you could pick first, but you could end up going last because you picked the lower number. Yeah. That's the the main mechanism. Yeah. Um, this is my next number is 48. 
Uh, this is the one that I'm going to predict we have a crossover in this 10 with, just based on your reaction. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. This is, this is, if I were a betting man, I bet we're going to cross over on this one, though. 48 for me is Euphoria. Uh, this is from Stonemeyer Games. This is the dice placement uh, game from, from Stonemeyer, where you're leading a kind of dystopian world, but done in an art deco, upbeat art style. Um, so you're basically put these, putting these die out. The die are the worst part of the game because they take a while to get adjusted to reading the pips on. Not horrible, but like, the first five times you roll, you're like, uh, is that a one or a six? Wait, what? And so then you figure that out after a little bit, but you don't want to roll high numbers for the most part because if you get too high, you you bonk and you lose one of your workers. They escape your compound. They got too intelligent so that the pips on there stand for intelligence. However, you want some intelligence because sometimes when you go to a spot, you get a better benefit if you can break into the next like level of intelligence on that spot. So you get more electricity or more citrus fruits or whatever you're trying to get. So um, it's kind of cool. The best part about this game, the mechanic that you really have to see come alive and play it to enjoy it is this bumping mechanic where it's awesome because I think your threshold is 16 on this game and then you have like a baseline intelligence so like if I'm playing against Jason he might have a base intelligence of like 5 so he can't have die above 11 in front of him so if he has 3 total workers and he has 9 on his two die that are waiting to be placed in front of him. If I bump him out of a spot, he's got to roll that die immediately. And if he rolls anything then higher than a two, then he loses one of his die permanently until he activates a new one. So it's, it's kind of a like gotcha kind of mechanism done in a Euro game, which is kind of weird. So um, I really like it though. The production on it's really great. There's a new edition out. Um, not really a new edition, new printing, I guess that has game trays in it, which makes the game even quicker to set up and get out of the box. Um, really cool game. I don't see this one going down next year, honestly. Uh, Euphoria 48. Yeah, that's a good pick. Uh, I like that game quite a bit. And my number 47. That was, that was <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> Uh, my number 47 is a game that all I know about it is every card has Vincent Dutrade art. It all has Vincent Dutrade art. And I played this one time, but I played a whole game and that's how, and I love it this much that it made number 47. And that game is Museum. The game's... Cult of the Future. Yeah, it's not even out yet, but I love this game. Like, it was still prototype um, cards and stuff and it was still amazing. It's basically a light set collection game, not even difficult at all. It's not heavy. You're trying to collect these different types of artifacts from different areas of the world to create these collections in your museum. And you're doing this over so many rounds. And the whole game is basically one giant set collection. You're trying to have your museum organized by colors, by types. The more stuff you can get organized, the more points you get. So the better you do at taking cards throughout the game, the better you're going to score. There's more to it than that, but that's essentially the whole game. And it's beautiful because Vincent Dutrait does great artwork. So my number 47, Museum. I should have backed it when I was on Kickstarter. I didn't. Kicking myself. So once it comes out, this is an instant buy for me. Same. Um, I haven't played it yet. I've just like watched play of it. Um, but I think I got like hip to this one right as the Kickstarter closed. Um, so it feels like we've been waiting forever for it and it feels like it should be in retail like real soon. Like it's been a while since the Kickstarter closed. Like I want to say the Kickstarter was mid 2018. Um, yeah, that sounds right. Cause it was, it was, it might've been over by the time origins was around. Yeah, it was definitely over. Um, cause I wanted to check it out at origins and I knew that I missed the Kickstarter. So I'm a hundred percent positive. It was the Kickstarter was over by origins last year. So, um, it should be out anytime now. And the only thing I'm going to take exception with what you said is that Vincent Dutrait can do no wrong um, because I, my friend, have owned New York 1909 and that cover is rough, bud. Well, so. that, yeah, that's true. I mean, okay, so everybody's not perfect, but he has a lot of good stuff on, on his... Uh, yeah, no, he's one of the yeah. best artists in the industry. But as long as you didn't have to drop pictures of like people of Dutch ancestry building a city in <laughs> 1909, it's fine. Yeah, that's true. I don't really love that game, the look of it either. So I'm with you. The actual board and stuff is really cool, but like, yeah, the cover of that just, I don't like it. <laughs> and people talk about how much they love it and how beautiful it is. It's just, I don't, it's not my thing, man. Yep. All right. Uh, speaking of um, hmm, transitions being hard, um, <laughs> number 47 is Terra Mystica. Oh, man. Um, this is a game that's really cool. It's dropped a ton um, from where it was when I first played it. Like, it was probably one of my favorite games when I first played it. 
Um, however, there's a game that's about 20 slots higher than it, uh, maybe 30 even, that has done a lot of what it does. Um, and even in the designer's notes, he thanks Terra Mystica for inspiration. So um, there's a newer game that I feel like streamlines Terra Mystica a little bit, gets rid of that tacked on sideboard kind of, um, which, and it's not Gaia Project. I actually haven't played Gaia Project yet. I probably would like it a lot, but um, that tacked on sideboard is a little weird to me. Um, and then it has like the fiddly stuff with the shovels and the pedals that like, I don't feel like adds to the fun of the game that much. It just adds things to it to add things to it. Um, but overall, it still is a really great game, and it deserves to be in the top 100, in my opinion. And that's number 47, Terra Mystica. I agree. I do like that game a lot. I would like to play it more, but I don't want to teach it. So I just want to jump into some game that where people know how to play it and just play. Yeah, and I mean, like, I don't know. Um, <sighs> um, there's another game that I don't think I've alluded to at all or mentioned um, called Clans of Caledonia that like gets rid of some of that stuff and I would way rather teach that game than Terra Mystica and I feel like you get a lot of the same feeling from that other game so I, I that other game didn't make my top 100 <laughs> I'm going to say in this episode for the sake of this episode <laughs> yeah we'll see uh, yeah I, I do like I do like both of them but I think I prefer Terra Mystica it's a little beefier um, my number 46 is, I don't know if it's my favorite game from this designer, but it's definitely one that I really enjoy and it's from Uwe Rosenberg and it is La Havre. I really, really like La Havre. I like it better than Agricola cause I think Agricola was on last week's list. I'm pretty sure. And if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick La Havre over Agricola. I like how you can build your buildings. You get these big engines going where you're getting turning your cows into meat and you have 500 pieces of meat and you're trying to get on a ship so you can sell it and score a ton of points. Yeah. Easy game. You're taking two, one of two decisions. You're either taking stuff from a port or you're going to visit a building to take an action. Super simple. But as the game progresses in true Uwe fashion, there are like a hundred places you can go. So if you like worker placement, you like lots of contract fulfillment and resource management. This is the game for you. My number 46 is La Havre. I'm with you, man. I think this is better than Agricola 2. Um, and I would put it higher than Agricola 2, um, but like a couple weeks from now, at least. <laughs> so um, Yeah, it, I'm, I'm no, surprised how low it is, too. I really enjoy this game, but man, yeah. You're, man, you, your top 40 must be all like Japanime games or something. I don't know. <laughs> no, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, man, I, uh, I'm with you. This is the anti-Agricola in a way, too. Because I feel like in Agricola, every round you're like, okay, how can I figure out how to scratch a living out and not damage what I'm trying to do? Right, yeah. In La Havre, you're like, oh, man, I can get 15 <laughs> steel. I can get 500 fish. Yeah. I can get 1,000 of this or build this building that's going to make me amazing. Like Every choice you have in that is like, you feel like you won the lottery. So it's like- yep. <laughs> for sure it's like it's like he heard complaints about agricola and he's like all right you want generous options i'll show you generous <laughs> options so yeah. that's that's uh that's where this game falls in there i yep. think agreed all right number 46 jason is a game that absolutely needs to get played by you and i um it's a classic and this is one that i it hurts me you've not played it um we've talked about it before it's power grid um it's just so good at one point it was like if you would ask someone what's your favorite heavy euro power euro game, power grid would be the answer for a lot of people. It was just that popular for a while, and it was considered a heavy euro game at one time. And I'd say now it's solidly midweight. I mean, like the rule set on it is pretty simple. I mean, it's not hard rules wise, but it's got tough choices uh, in there, and there's a lot of mathing things out. So that does add to the heaviness a little bit. But in this game, basically, you're running a power network. You're building building uh, connections between places. And then on top of that, you're buying fuel to power your generators. And then you're trying to buy better generators in an auction. So it's got auctions in there too. So um, a cool game. I really like it. They've messed it up a few times with different expansion type revamp games of it. But I think there is another de definitive kind of better edition coming out this year. So that one might get a rebirth a little bit, but it's, it's setting squarely at number 46, Power Grid. Yeah, I do need to play this. I feel like I am being remiss since I haven't played it. So, yeah, some someday, someday I'll play it. Someday, someday. Oh man, I just lost my numbers again. All right, sweet. Forty-five, Jason. 
All right, my number 45 is a game that's in the Dice Tower Essential line. And it's probably only this high because I played it a ton with people who don't play a ton of board games, and I still have a good time playing it. And that game is Royals. So Royals is Ticket to Ride meets Area Control. You're collecting these colored sets of cards to end up playing them into these certain areas on the map. You're trying to get so many cubes in certain areas so you can get these little tiles that are worth some points. If you can add the most of a certain color at the end of every age, you're going to get some more points. If you can control different types of nobles at the end of the game, if you have more cubes on them than anybody else, you get you get some more points. If you tie, you split the tile and each person shares. It's really fun. It's really simple. It takes three minutes to teach and plays in about 30 to 40 minutes. So if you like card collection, like rummy style and a little bit of area control and getting in each other's faces a little bit, Royals, my number 45. My number 45, Jason. Uh, Royals was 78 for me, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I talked about it quite a bit on the episode three weeks ago or something. Um, but, yeah, good game. My number 45 is uh, Colonists, and this is based on me playing this game solo and playing just like a one-era game with other people. So, um, boy, I don't know what to think about this one, honestly. I don't know if this one's going to hold up and stay this high on the list, but I, I feel like this is my epic heavy euro game that is like in my collection that i enjoy and it's at number 45 i have since um making this list played and, and acquired a copy of arkwright um so arkwright would probably be above colonists if i had a chance to put it on the list and that's just me playing the spinning jenny edition of it so um boy i i don't know this one's probably not gonna hang around but it's still a good game um, and I think it might stay in the top 100, um, but 45 is a little high. Uh, and so six weeks ago, Joel, shame on you. But it's this cool game where you're like basically building a little like cloister using a bigger area in the center of the board to work to make cloister stuff for you. So um, I don't know. It's uh, cloister is probably a totally wrong word there, but um, like just a little village kind of thing that you're using the influence of another guy that's doing your bidding for you on a main board to get more things unlocked on your little board to make it better, to unlock better things and etc. It's just building up the full game on this. I'm going to guess even with people who are playing at a pretty quick pace is going to take four hours. Uh, so it's a big, long game. I think people thought let's make a Euro game version of TI four. Um, so that was colonist. Yeah, I played one age of this at Origins. I think the year it came out. I, it was cool. I think I need to actually dive into it without the game teacher trying to tell me what moves to make because I don't really love that. So it does seem cool, though. Yeah, it seems like you had a bad demo. Like I think you've mentioned that on the show yeah, before. Yeah, it wasn't, a, it wasn't um, great, that's for sure. Yeah. A, a cool game. Um, I don't know. I, it's, like I said, probably not going to hang on to the top 50 spot forever. Um, yeah, it's just, if I'm going to play a big, heavy, long Euro game, uh, there's other options now I like better. Yeah, I, I would probably agree with that. Uh, all right. My number 44 is a game from Days of Wonder, Bruno Catala, Mancala, and that game is Five Tribes. This is one of my favorite Days of Wonder games, if not my favorite. Um, I really like it. It's really simple. Sort of. I mean, the general rule is simple. Pick up some dudes move around the map where you end, you take all the dudes of the same color and you get to take a special power. You're trying to get um, people of a, like little meeples of a certain color. So you can recruit some genies. They give you special powers. They give you a b- bunch of points. You're trying to collect some cards that are like different types of goods. So if you can have all that at the end of the game, there were different points or you can sell them during the game for money. Good game, really easy. And it's beautiful because it's days of wonder. So if you like, medium weight euros i recommend this one so five tribes my number 44 yeah um i had this one down at like 73 Uh, i like it as well a really cool game probably the heaviest days of wonder game i can think of off the top of my head i think it's heavier than yamata yeah i would agree with that um and then when you introduced this game like i had like a like boom like a tribe called quest baseline going through my head (sighs) and you were like man kala Bruno, Cathala. Like, it was just like a <laughs> rap song ready to happen there. I don't know. Yeah, if only I would have thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe next week. I don't know. You can, uh, 
You can move it up 10 spots. We're going to look back at it. <laughs> yeah. Recycled jokes. I love it. Uh, okay. Uh, my number 44, Jason, is one that actually you taught me. Uh, Century Spice Road. And since then, I've picked up a copy myself. Uh, just a cool game. I mean, like, there's three rules. But <laughs> the way how the cards play out, yeah. like, it's a cool game, you know? Um, it's like, put a card down. And if you want to pick a card up, go ahead. Or you can... Build one of these things if you have the resources to do it. Um, so a cool game. I love it a lot. And this is, I'm going to talk some trash here for just a second. Don't play this with Jed. All right. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I don't know if I played it with him, but I can see that. <laughs> he likes this game a lot, but it takes two hours with him. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does. <laughs> uh, so that's funny. Anyway, I'm talking trash about him, but uh, I love that guy, but he's a little analysis paralysis prone, and this game I didn't think was an AP prone game. No, it's, it shouldn't be. apparently it is. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. You definitely don't play Eastern Wonders with him then, or it'll take three hours. I Man, that's the other thing, too. Like, that's one where I was like, oh, that's awesome, that, that Spice Road, like, held on, um, because, like, the only other time I remember people being more hyped about a new game coming out to like add to or replace an old game was Caverna and Agricola, which like, I think Caverna is fine, but Agricola is still great. And like, so that one was totally fake. And this one was like, when this thing was getting ready to come out, people were like, so what are you going to use your copy of Spice Road for? Like, are you going to like start a campfire with it? Or are you going to like, uh, I don't know. Everyone was talking about how just, I don't know, like going into the, brand new hype of Eastern Wonders. Everyone was like, this game's going to be so awesome. And then I don't think I've heard a single person other than I think maybe Kim, when she was talking about her top 100 that likes Eastern Wonders better than, than Spice Road. Yeah. I don't think Kim dug, digs the card thing in Spice Road, but that's what I love. Like if you can win that game by drafting two cards, like I've won the game having seven cards total. So I have five cards and I've won. I mean, <laughs> that's what I love about it. You can just maximize your engine and then, it's super quick. Yeah, I love Spice Road. It's good. Well, when you think about it, when you take a card, that's a wasted action almost, unless you're doing something that's going to like give you a return on investment of like getting a bunch of spices or something later right. in the game. But because like you don't get anything, you get a card, you know? Yep. So no. it lets you not rest as often, I guess, too, maybe. But yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I've not played Eastern Wonder, so it's not fair of me to say that. I've just watched like reviews and playthroughs of it, but like I don't, I feel like they were like, Hey guys, this Spice Road game's really taken off. Can you uh, rework it into something else to sell more games? Uh, yeah, but it's going to be clunky and add a bunch of junk no one cares about. It's fine, sell it. Like that's kind of how I feel about Eastern Wonders. Yeah, actually. I've played Eastern Wonders, and I don't know. It it does like Century Spice Road is so slick and like streamlined, and Century just turns it into a pick up and deliver game. It's super hard to to complete contracts because you got to make sure your boat's in the right port, and you got to build huts on these ports to get goods. Yeah, it's 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 not as good. I don't like it. And then you're supposed to be able to play the two cards together, but like or two games together, but it's like <laughs> not really. Yeah. Even. Take the cards out of Spice Road, I guess, and I don't know, like it just doesn't it doesn't feel like it's like using the components from Spice Road in a different game is what yeah. it feels like, not like they're actually meshing Pretty together. Pretty much. Yep. All right, my number 43 is a game from Bezier. And it is, I think, the mm. only game I have of theirs. Uh, yes. And it is the Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Hmm. This is one of my favorite tile games. I really enjoy it. I like the setting the price of the rooms for other people. Like you may want to, you really want a room, so you make it the most expensive. But then in order for you to buy, you have to pay the most money. So you might try to put it in the least valuable and hope nobody takes it. And it's just fun to build your castle however you want and see what shape it turns out. And I don't know. I dig it. It's, it's fun. It's silly. So castles of Mad King Ludwig, my number 43. I think we disagree about, um, this one a little bit in that, like you stand by the old classic, uh, castles of Mad King Ludwig. And I, I think it's a cool game. I like it a lot. Um, and I think it's really funny to be like, Hey, look at my castle. It has, like a children's romper room right by my bedroom. That doesn't make any sense at <laughs> yeah, all, but yeah. whatever. It's fun. Yep. And then there's a dungeon right off the kitchen <laughs> corner. I don't know. Like that's kind of funny. And it's like, it's like you're playing architect. Like I think everybody, when they were a kid, like 
drew out pictures of like, this would be my dream house. Here's the water slide. And here's the like chocolate pudding fountain. I don't know. Like when you're a kid, you draw like those pictures of like layouts of buildings and stuff. I think everybody does that. And I think this game like lets you kind of do that same thing where you're making a layout of a really cool building that you really like. So I, I think it's a cool game, Jason. I like it a lot. I though like between two castles of Mackie and Ludwig um, a little better. Um, and I know you didn't care for it that much, but like, I think it does a lot of the same stuff of like getting to like lay out a castle and have fun with it. It just takes some of the like space and shape sizing things out of it. And then it also doesn't really do anything with that, uh, like auction pricing mechanism kind of thing almost, which is a cool mechanic for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I might need to play, ca- I haven't played castles in over a year. I might need to play that one again just to get a good feel. Yeah. For between it. two castles makes it kind of feel like a co-op and I, that's what I didn't love about that game. Still fun, but. I don't like that aspect of it. Yeah, I I see I'm a sociopath, so I felt of it like felt like more like there was another element in that game where I was using people as pawns to do my bidding. <laughs> so like it wasn't a co-op really. <laughs> so Yeah, I guess you could or there is that. Yeah, you're right. Uh my number 43, Jason, that's what we're yep. on, right? Ah, this is the game that Elmo introduced me to when I was a child. It's a game called Near Far, um, near, near and Far by Red Raven Games. Um, this one's interesting because it's supposed to be like a like legacy-ish campaign type game, uh, telling a story and having narratives that you play through in this game where like little stories happen. Um, there's no choices in it. Like every little narrative that you have, like there is kind of choices, but like I kind of wanted it to be like Tales of the Arabian Nights where there's like a like, like a, like basically like a rubric that you kind of cross reference things and like there's unique kind of things that happen at each spot. Um, and you get all these crazy choices. It doesn't quite go that deep, but every time you go to a number, you read a passage out of this book and then you have choices. So the good thing about that is actually the stories match up with what's happening on the board really well. Whereas in tales of the Arabian nights, it's like you're in the middle of a desert and all of a sudden like there's a flood and you have to swim. I, I don't know. Like it's, Weird stuff like that happens there. Plus, there's an actual game to this one. Um, there's a really good worker placement game in this game. Um, basically, a, a rebuilding kind of game in this. In this, so it has that narrative book kind of thing going on with it. But that's an element of an overall better game, I think. So, um, really cool. The thing that's weird about it though is I've never played this as the campaign where you keep track of your characters and play it from from time to time. Just because I have too many other campaign games to play, I think it'd be great like that. But it's really great just playing the one hitter like hey we're just going to play this one time using this set of like rules and stuff so um just and there's really three ways you can play it so um a lot of game in that box i think you did a good job with this and i think this might be you know in 10 years considered red ravens kind of like opus you know so near and far yeah it does look cool uh well all their games do i don't know i don't even know how i feel about this one yet but i may try it sometime I think you'd like above and below better because it's more of a Euro game than this one. And there's less of that like storytelling junk right. in it. Um, but junk to you, precious gems to <laughs> everybody me. else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. My number 40 list 42, 42. <laughs> is a game from stone It may or may not have already been listed. Spoiler, it has, and it is Euphoria. Uh, woo, woo. Yeah, I, re- I really like this game. I've played it, I don't know, three or four times at multiple player counts. I've never played it at full player counts because that's crazy. I think I've played it at three and four mostly, and at four, it's super fun. Um, it's basically a Euro sandbox game, which is kind of nice. So you can do anything you want wherever you want. You just have to make sure that you adhere to the knowledge checks. You don't have too many cards in your hand and it's up to you to determine how you're going to get stars on the board. I don't normally love sandbox games, but in this one, it feels right. So you already talked about it. I'm not going to beat the dead horse. So my number 42, Euphoria. So this game, um, it does better at higher player counts by most people's like recommendations. Uh, Four is the highest one recommended best. And then it's crazy at max player count at six, 53% of people recommend this game. Wow. So um, I've, I've heard just that it does really well when the board gets crowded and that, that bumping thing gets more and more important and just cool. cooler. So I think honestly, I mean, think about it, Jason, you got six people at a board game thing and they're for whatever reason, 
probably just to make you mad because you would insist on doing two groups yep. of three. But like, but like, uh, they're saying, no, we only have one table and we have to be holding hands, playing a game this whole time. I can't think of a game that plays six that I would rather play than this one. That's true. I mean, I would play it it's way better than a lot of other games that play six. That's for sure. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, I think you could play six and it wouldn't take forever. I don't know. Um, but yeah, good pick. <laughs> Unless um, Jed's playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean the other thing though is you could probably have a, a game of like century spice road going on the <laughs> same table true. and like everyone could do their turn in euphoria while just doing his turn on century spice road <laughs> and then like everyone could do their spice road turn while he's doing his euphoria turn so <laughs> yeah uh, uh poor jed so my number 42 uh ennis ennis however you want to say it uh, this is from Matigo Games. Um, this is like the same size box as Kemet and Cyclades, so it gets compared to them all the time. And it's dudes on a map, I guess, too. But they're really nothing alike. I mean, like they even call them a trilogy at times. But this is a card drafting game. Um, it's a game that you, the first time you play it, just figure out how to play the game. And then the second time you play it, you're like, oh, here's maybe some strategy. And then the third time it like really clicks and you're like, oh, okay. So really the whole point of this game though, is that you have to call your shot and say, I'm going to win next round. And then you have to be able to figure out how you can make a viable strategy for winning the next round. In addition to being able to defend the fact that you're going to win. It's that whole thing of like chess of like check and then check me, you know? So the fact of like getting the winning conditions, is not that hard? Like you can get the winning conditions of this game in a few rounds fairly quickly, but other people can jack you up and mess up your winning condition. It's getting the winning condition in enough ways and in enough ways that you can't be beaten down off of your, of your winning stance. That makes this game kind of interesting. Um, and like people who watch you play this game, I think even you said it, you're like, is it a like guys on a map game or is it a card game? Like it's kind of hard to tell. And the answer is yes, it is like, it's really equal parts. So uh cool game though. Pretty different from most other games that I played, honestly. Um, and the thing I really do love about it, it's absurd, but it's one of those just details that makes this game better are the land tiles or these triangles with these weird jaggedy edges, but they fit together like perfectly and you'd never would think so. So um, it's just a cool game. Yeah, I still, like, I've watched playthroughs on this, and I still have no idea how to play this game, or if it's a card game or a dudes on a map game. It's crazy. Like, it's not, I know it's not something I would enjoy, but I I like to research games because it's something that I think is fun. And I, yeah, I have no idea what this game is, but it is. it does look good, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you'd like it either. Um, but it's for people who like dudes on a map and like card drafting, give it a shot. Cool. All right, my number 41 and my last one I want to talk about today is from AEG. And I got an expansion for it at Christmas time called Mocha and Bakshish. And this game is Istanbul. Mm. I played this game a whole bunch. Um, I don't, it's not even like a super amazing game, but every time I play it, I have a great time. It's a race. You're trying to be the first one to get a certain amount of gems depending on player count. You're doing that by. Um, cashing in resources to buy gems. You're spending money to buy gems. Sometimes it's doing something first, like maybe getting a couple of these two yellow, these yellow tiles. If you're the first person to do that, you get some gems. I don't know. It's it, again, it's kind of like uh, the euphoria thing where you can do it however you want. You just need to make sure that you do it better than somebody else. You're moving around the board, leaving a little guy behind. If you want to move back to somewhere else, you got to make sure you can go where you can pick up a guy. Or you have to go back to the fountain and everybody gathers around. So the movie mechanism is really cool too. So if you're into interesting Euro games that, I don't know, this is probably light to medium Euro. If you like those, then I'd say check out Istanbul, my number 41. I mean, I I really liked it back when it was called Constantinople. <laughs> because I'm such a game hipster. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it's an awesome game, and it was never called Constantinople. I think there's a game called Constantinople, but Istanbul, awesome game, very cool. It won the Spiel one year, um, but you just don't hear a whole lot about it, um, or at least it was nominated. I think it did win the Spiel, actually. I don't know. Um, I mean, the modular board's cool. That It plays a little different all the time. Um, very cool game. People say Yokohama fires it. 
I own both, and I think I'm happy to own both. So, um, very cool game. I'm not going to talk much more about it because I'm just not going to right <laughs> now. Um, no, I like it a lot. I do. Um, cool game. I played the dice game too. The dice game is not bad. So if you're going to play one of the dice versions of a game, Nations or Istanbul dice game, both pretty good. Um, but that's just a slight tangent there. Uh, those aren't top 100 material. So getting back to top 100 material, uh, Jason, I'm going to go ahead and admit this. This one's a little bit call to the new, but this is like, I think when I made this top 100, it's like, what games do I want to play right now today? And like, maybe not today, but like, this era of my life. And this one's definitely above near and far. I don't know that it's going to stay there. And that's Empires of the Void 2. Uh, this one's got kind of a little bit like, a, I don't know, almost like a space Puerto Rico kind of thing going on with it, where you're like doing action selection and people can kind of follow and um, just a neat game. Um, it fixed, it actually is totally different really than Empires of the Void, the first game. The first Empires of the Void game was kind of cool. It just kind of like had a, have a lot of fixes made for it, like some homebrewed stuff that you had to do to really make it pop. This one just pops right out of the box. So it just shows where Ryan Lockett's become a better designer over the years, um, in my opinion. Um, really cool, really cool components in it. Nice little molds of ships, good art. The art on it is excellent because usually when you have a space game, it's like black with specks of like white all over it. This one's got like really cool shades of blue all over it. Like they've paid really fine detail to the background of the board, even that it wasn't just a plain black drab board to look at. So, um, a really cool space game that involves combat miniatures and exploration. So Jason, um, I will go ahead and edit those vomiting sounds out of the background there. Uh, when I do the editing this week, but that's my number 41 empires of the void too. Cool. So yeah, yeah. it's definitely not my thing, but I mean, I have looked at pictures and it does look cool. So that's cool. Because you can, you like to research yep, games. That is true. I do. Well, awesome. Uh, that was a good 10, Jason. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I like most of your games, mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. Like nine yeah. of them. I mean, like out of them, like. I, yeah, I don't know. The the ones that involve plastic, you don't like that much, but the ones that involve wood, you <laughs> yep, like. Yeah, that's true. We had one crossover with Euphoria, I think, right? And then I had a couple that were in the 70s that popped up on your list this time yep. around. So, um, yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, in the next, in the next, uh, not in the next 10 even, I'm going to give a like little teaser. I have three games in a row that follow the same formula, and I just looked at my list. The first letter of the game is an R. It has two like small conjunction conjunction type words or preposition type words, and then it ends with a word that starts with a G. So R blank blank G, and there's three in a row. Like and it just worked out that way. That's weird. Yeah, so that's a little riddle for you guys. I know we like games here, so see if you can figure out what those three are. Um, yeah, uh, if you're new to us because you've come to us from the giveaway, welcome. We're glad you're here, and more giveaways coming. So pretty awesome. That's true. We just got one that showed up in the mail this week, and more on that later. Yeah, and that's a really good giveaway. Like, I'll be jealous of whoever wins that one. Yep, as you should be. Uh, awesome. Um, well, cool. I don't really have anything else. Nope, I'm good. All right, I'm Joel. And I'm Jason. Keep gaming. Keep gaming.